Good morning. Good morning. We want to welcome you this morning. We're glad to see everybody, and uh, we want a record of your presence. If you would take your attendance pads and sign them and pass them, we'd appreciate it so much. I want to welcome those of you joining us at home uh, via YouTube. We're so glad you're watching us and worshiping with us. And be sure to hit the like button and the share button and uh, share the link with others. So good to see everybody this morning. Sherry, and it looks like Heather and Sherry are our announcements for the day. If there's anybody else, we'll invite them to come on up. Good morning. Okay, on Sunday, July 31st, not only are we having the fifth Sunday fellowship with donuts in the morning, um, we're having a sack lunch Sunday for the kids. So if parents want to um, bring a pack of lunch for the kids, we're doing extended child care, and they can um, stay here at the church till 2 o'clock, and mom and dad can either go out to lunch with friends or go to Walmart or take a nap or whatever it is that you want to do, that's your time, but we'll have you covered in the nursery and in the kids area until two o'clock. So we'll have signups. Um, just let me know if you're wanting to drop your kids and we'll get you signed up. Um, I'm so excited to announce that we will be in fact having our Aloha back to school luncheon for the Allen Bowden staff. Hey girl. Um, we were a little nervous about it. Um, well, I was a little nervous about it. Um, Principal Amy Carnes left the school, and then the superintendent, Kenny Mason, also left the school, and they were our main connections getting in. But after lots of prayer and reaching out, they are thrilled um, to let us partner with them again this year for the Thursdays, the back-to-school luncheon, and things like that. So thank you for praying, and keep praying as we get to reach out to the staff again this year. Um, we will um, have sign-ups for the luncheon, and we'll also have um, sponsor sponsorships for praying, praying for the teachers and, and the whole entire staff. Um, it's not just the teachers, it's the aides, it's the, the lunch ladies, the bus drivers, the custodians. We want to encase everybody in prayer and let them know that we are supporting them this year. So we will have that sign up starting next week also. So if you want to help us out with that, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Heather. Good morning. I just wanted to invite anybody that's interested in missions to a meeting on Thursday night at 6.30 here at the church. We're just going to be determining what uh, various opportunities that have come our way, what we can actually uh, take part in, what we want to be a part of, and what God has for us to be a part of. So if you're interested in missions at all, it doesn't mean we're going to put you to work for 10 hours a week. Just come and find out what we're doing. Uh, give us some input of what you think is ours to do, and we'd love to have you come when, uh, Thursday at 6.30. And you may notice on our schedule, on the calendar schedule, it says shoulder to shoulder every day. There is a mission group here in town that we have done projects with, the Shoulder to Shoulder Ministries. They are going to be using our facility for part of their outreach and summer a mission as similar to what they did last year so if you come by and see that group coming in and out you'll know what they are up to I also want to just mention there is a meeting this afternoon at Christ United Methodist Church at 2 o'clock uh, a representative of our conference office is coming uh, it's a district a stated district miss, uh, meeting as uh, scheduled by our district superintendent to deal with the issues that are going on in the Methodist Church and the process of disaffiliation which so many churches now are going through. I don't know what they're going to say or what they're going to do. I've had people ask me, well, what is this meeting and who all can go to that? I was given very specific uh, instructions as to who to invite, specific key leaders. Uh, so this is not an open meeting. Uh, I followed the instructions of the DS to the T as to who to invite to that meeting. But once we have that meeting, we will try to uh, share the information with the congregation. Again, I have no idea uh, what, what the presentation will hold, uh, but we will pass that information on. And that's what that meeting's about, if you've heard rumors about it or rumblings or wondering who's supposed to attend. So, uh, not seeing any other announcements, Cabe, do you want to come up and we'll ask the congregation to please rise and Cabe will lead us in our call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Sing to him a new song. 
Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. 140, great is thy faithfulness. standing as Cabe leads us in our prayer of confession and praise. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love jo joys beyond understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God's peace be with you. Would you extend a greeting of peace and welcome?
Okay, please be seated and our praise team will lead us in, in a song of praise.
Thank you, praise team. Let us pray. Lord, we are not alone, but you are with us. You go before us and you constantly guide us. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds now by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today through Christ our Lord. Amen. Those of you who are able, if you'd please stand. Uh, Cave is going to come and read passages from Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. This is Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 through 32, and then chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you heard, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be unified to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, choir. We are continuing today in our studies on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we come to a passage today, and I've linked it with a couple of passages from uh, Matthew 19 that's just going to be a whole lot of fun. What a difficult, challenging passage. But uh, let me begin by saying, I guess this is the season for anniversaries. I received a notice in the mail about a week ago from my doctor, Candy Ting. I had the privilege of marrying she and her husband. And it was an invitation to attend a 40-year wedding anniversary and celebration for them. Then one morning in June, I received a phone call early in the morning. as from a friend, Matt Riffle. Uh, who was members of my church in Seminole. And he said, Alan, do you know what today is? And I said, well, kind of, what are you referring to? And he said, uh, several years ago today, in fact, I think he said it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago today, you were with me and my wife at Fin and Feather as you celebrated the the uh, reunion or the reaffirmation of our marriage vows. And he said, today is our 43rd uh, wedding anniversary. And that was significant because Christy and I were coming up on our 46th that same week. So that was a wonderful time. And then I got an email from a friend who said she and her husband are getting ready to celebrate their 17th anniversary. And she was very excited about that. But she said, you know, sometimes marriage is hard and difficult, so my husband and I, for our anniversary, number 17, are going to do a marriage retreat, a little vacation, and we're going to seek a time for renewal and reaffirmation. And, you know, at times, renewal in marriages are needed. And I I emailed her back. I said, that's so important because I said, quite frankly, couples that have been married a long time, uh, it's not like marriage is a direct straight line just always going up. It's, it's more like a roller coaster, you know, at times with ups and, and downs. And there are times in our marriage, and couples that have been married a long time realize this, when they need to get away, they need to renew, they need to renew their vows. They need to pay attention to the words of Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 that says, Uh, repent and do the things you did at first, meaning go back and think of the things that you did and the way you related when you first fell in love and renew those things in your marriage. And that's one of the secrets is coming to those points and times where marriages can find rest and renewal. So then we come to the Sermon on the Mount and this passage in chapter 5, verse 31 Uh, which is kind of a challenging passage. Uh, Jesus deals with the issue of divorce. We find a similar passage in Matthew 19, where again in that passage is being tested by the Pharisees about the nature of divorce and his understanding of divorce. And uh, in these contexts, Jesus says so much more than just a reflection about divorce. In these passages, what he really does is set before us a vision of the nature of marriage. And in this, especially in chapter 19, he tells us that through marriage, God is calling us to a life of faithfulness and promise-keeping. That's that's at the heart of what marriage is all about, a life of making promises and vows to love, honor, honor, nurture and and cherish one another, and faithfulness, forsaking all others, uh, and committing ourselves to this person in, in commitment and faithfulness, marriage is an invitation to a life of faithfulness and promise keeping. And as we look at these passages, there are two or three things I think we should consider. First of all, focusing primarily on chapter 19, is strongly affirmed that marriage is God's idea. Marriage was created by God. Let's look at these verses. It says, When he had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea, the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed there. And some Pharisees came and noticed their purpose to test him. 
And they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus said, haven't you read? He replied that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. And he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. They are no longer two but one. Therefore what God has joined together... Let no one separate. And he makes it very clear that marriage was originated by God. Marriage was God's idea. And in these few three verses here, we see several very important things about the nature of marriage. First of all, marriage in a Christian understanding is grounded in the order of creation. He created us male and female, and there to come together as male and female. We are in marriage as a result of the nature of creation that God gave us, and that is significant because in Christian theology that theme and that truth carries over even to the understanding of our relationship with God and our relationship with Christ who is seen in Scripture as the the groom, and we, his church, his people, as the bride of Christ. And some of the most glorious passages in Scripture talk about when the Lord returns and we will be reunited or united fully with his bride, and we will enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Marriage was created by God. It is, pro, it is intended to provide for us intimate fellowship. We come together as one flesh. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. They will no longer be two, but one. And again we reflect back to the story of creation and how God said it is not good for man to be alone. And man represents male and female. It's not good for women to be alone either. We need one another. And God in his wisdom has brought us together in families and instituted and created the covenant of marriage that we might be in intimate fellowship and friendship and intimate nurture and care and listening and understanding and all of the wonderful terms that describe the essence of relationship. And given all of this, it's to be entered into with intention and, per, and, and promise because the intent of marriage is that it be everlasting, that it be permanent. It says, so they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And that is the concluding statement of the wedding vows. As a couple make their vows together, and I pronounce that and usually use the sign of the cross and, and share them what, what God, see it's God that has joined them together. And no, let no one separate them. So our understanding of marriage is that it's a serious covenant between two people. It's, it's not just a legal status, which it is, but it's also a covenant promise made before God and it's to be entered into with seriousness and with the intent of faithfulness. You know, I've done a lot of weddings uh, over my years, 46 years as a United Methodist pastor, and most of them, uh, I will have to say, the couples were, <laughs> knew what they were getting into and were very serious. And I have had some interesting uh, responses when kind of uh, interviewing or visiting with couples. I remember one young lady, she was so young, and, and I actually, you know, wondered, was she really ready for this? And I said, so, uh, are you feel you're ready for this step? This is a big step. I know you love this young man. Are you ready for this? She said, yeah. She said, you know, I've, when I was a Girl Scout as a child, I used to go off to summer camp, and I just kind of look, like it, look at it like I'm going off to summer camp for a while. And I, I thought, you know, there's a little bit more to it. than This isn't just a, this isn't just a week-long camping trip you're going on. There's a little bit more to it than this. You don't, if you get homesick, you don't just call and say, hey, come get me. I mean, there's, there's, this is a little more 
serious than this. I, I had one person in talking to them about their marriage and their preparation. They said, well, I don't know if we're ready or not. We're going to give it a try. If it doesn't work out, we can always get a divorce. And I thought, somehow you're kind of missing. Did you, did you get the premarital counseling package that we include with this deal? There, the, it, it requires more serious reflection and intent. And we are to enter into marriage realizing that we're entering into a commitment with another person in a serious vow of faithfulness and with a desire to the best of our ability to make this work and to live our lives in honor and reflection and uh, in the very presence of God. But now let's be honest. There are times when marriage simply does not work. What then? And that was the circumstance that Jesus was being confronted with both in the Sermon on the Mount and in Matthew 19 as opponents of his came to test him or to try to trap him. And uh, you have to understand the context in which they brought was a context in which it was the Pharisees asking the question, but according to the Sadducees, Uh, A man could divorce his wife for for any and all reasons. All he had to do was write a certificate of divorce. You know, he's getting tired of this relationship. Just write this off. It was a frivolous kind of uh, separation of a covenant that had been made. And so they're asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And to that kind of question, Jesus gives some rather stinging and harsh words. And he says, uh, Moses permitted you divorce to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And you think, oh my gosh, that's, that's kind of harsh. In the Matthew 5 passage, it's briefer, but it's the same point. It has been said that anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Ouch. So what does that mean? Anyone who's gone through the trauma and the tragedy of divorce, somehow they are forever classed as some kind of second-class citizen in the citizen in the kingdom of God. They are somehow put in this... This, this class of, of people who have had such great moral failure that they can never be used of God once again. And, and, and we will be honest, there, there are some fellowships and churches that kind of take an approach like that. I have an uncle, uh, deceased now, who years and years ago, early in his life, went through a very traumatic uh, divorce remarried a wonderful Christian woman. They had a wonderful life together. He served in the church. Not a Methodist church, it served in a church uh, for years and years, was a great giver, taught, but he could never serve as a deacon in the church. Never could hold a position or office in the church. I, I finally, he and I kind of would joke each other back and forth. He and he, he would find reasons to give me the business about being Methodist and some of our beliefs, but believe me, I found plenty of fuel to return the favor and, and I said to him one day, in, in your church, did not anyone ever get forgiven for anything? Isn't there ever a washing away of sins and a moving forward with any kind of new life? Isn't there any, any sense of redemption or renewal in your church? And he said, well, that's just the way it is, and this is the church I attend, and I love those people, and I live by their rules. But when you look at the context... Look at the context of these words, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. Again and again and again, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Therefore, you have heard that it was said, but now I say to you. What were they hearing? They were hearing the rules and the regulations of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that had brought about a rural system upon the life of the community, in some cases very strict by the Pharisees, in other cases very loose by the Sadducees, in some cases to the point that marriage was taken very lightly and divorce could be uttered and almost any, could be offered in almost any excuse 
a reason. And in that context, Jesus shoots back at him and says, let me tell you how serious this is. Uh, This is a serious matter. I tell you, if anyone divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman becomes an adulteress commits adultery, and he shoots back with, with very harsh words. But, but consider the context. He's responding to people who are trying to trap him and responding to an extreme of another perspective. And it's, it's somewhat similar to when he says, if, if any of you, if your right hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. Because it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God lame than it is to continue in this path that might lead you into the fires of hell. And you're going, what? You mean if I've committed a crime, done something like that, I should cut off my hand? Or, Or Jesus says, if any of you are looking at a woman lustfully, you better pluck your eye out. Because it's better for you Uh, to enter the kingdom of heaven blind than to go on down this path of lust that may lead you to the fires of hell. And people, what are we literally to cut off our hand and pluck out our eye? And no, Jesus is using an extreme to counter their point to tell them that holiness is important. A life of purity is important. So what about when it comes to this issue of divorce? Again, a person who goes through a divorce, are they forever now a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God? Are they some way to be shunned because they've had a failure of relationship? And I think what I'd invite you to do is just to consider the whole scope of Scripture in addition to the context in which he uttered these words. And when we look to the whole scope of Scripture, what we find is a principle consistently through running through Scripture. And the principle is this. Grace is greater than human failure. Grace overwhelms and encompasses human failure. Grace triumphs over the failures and the sins and the struggles of our life. And so when we look in the Old Testament, we have a a guy named David. A man described as a man with a heart of God, truly had a heart for God. And yet here's a man that went up on a rooftop and got caught up in looking at his neighbor and lusting after her and invited her up for a little fellowship and ended up bearing a child with her and then committed a plot to do away with her husband. Terrible, terrible sequence and tragedy in his life for which there was punishment and for which there was a time of of consequences which was known by David in the community. And yet in the end, through that relationship, is born a child which ultimately continues and bears the line of the promised coming Messiah to come and bring redemption to the world. In, in, In the future, David becomes one who is redeemed and the mighty leader of Israel and the one who is well thought of as the one who is the shepherd king, who is the image of this Christ who is to come, this David, who was caught in adultery and participated in adultery and on and on and on. And yet in his life, as tragic as that moment was, as embarrassing as that moment was, as difficult as that moment was, grace transcends human failure. And his life was redeemed. We can go to the story of Hosea, and that's a prophet in the Old Testament. And boy, it starts off with a very strange word. As the Lord says to the prophet, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. And here we have the Lord leading him into a remarriage with a woman who has been unfaithful. And we're thinking... Who in the world would have done that? Whatever must God have been thinking? And yet when you look at what God was thinking, he said this this whole relationship and redemption story is just an illustration of my relationship with my people Israel who time and time again have gone astray and been unfaithful to me and they've needed my forgiveness and grace and as they've turned to me, I have healed their land and restored their spirit and brought them back to me. And in the same way, I do that with couples 
And in the same way, I do that with individuals who have had struggles and failures in their life because grace transcends human failure. I'll share with you a couple of stories. One is going to sound kind of strange, perhaps. Christy and I had a wonderful friend. She was actually the organist in my first church, organist and pianist, uh, one year younger than me and Christy. Uh, that, that's almost a separate kind of story. We took Christy and Bess and I went over to a, a retirement center one day to do a service, and at the end of the service, Bess was standing on one side and Christy on the other side, and this uh, older lady came up and said, Pastor, I really enjoyed your message. And she turned to Bess, and since she had played the piano, she assumed Bess was my. She said, you must be the pastor's wife. And I said, oh, no, this is our pianist, Bess Olson. This is my wife over here. And the lady looked at Bess, and she looked at Christy, and she looked back. She said, oh, yes, I can see now that, that this lady's much too young to be the pastor's wife. <laughs> I've teased Christy about that ever since. Bess was a wonderful, vivacious deeply devout person, had grown up in the Philippines. Her, her parents were Presbyterian missionaries, and she went off, left our Tulsa community to go up to Colorado to get her master's degree, and there she met a man and called, said, I'm coming back to Tulsa, I want to get married. And she came back, and I'll be honest with you, the first time I met her fiancé, I had red flags. I thought, I don't know about this. I said, Bess, are you really sure? And she said, well, he's growing. There's things that are taking place. But no, I think, I think this is what God wants. And she went ahead and married. And it wasn't long into the marriage. The problem started. Not just conflicts, but hostile conflicts, verbal abuse, and then finally physical abuse. And Christy and I watched, as we stayed in touch with our friend, we watched a vibrant, wholesome personality crumble crumble before our very eyes and she just couldn't quite bring herself being the daughter of a Presbyterian missionary she said I know I need to try to preserve my marriage and if there was anyone who tried and strived to fulfill the promises of her vows it was her but there finally came to a point and you might find this strange for a pastor and a family therapist that in a conversation with her, I said, Bess, you've got to get out of this marriage. You've got to bring an end to this. I said, it is true that God gets no glory from divorce, but I want to tell you right now, God gets no glory from seeing personalities destroyed or lives threatened or endangered. And she finally, uh, I think with that word of encouragement and the support from me and Christy, uh, separated and then finally divorced and then got the counseling and help she needed and then remarried and has had a wonderful life ever since then with a man with whom both of them took seriously their vows and could, could live a life together in faithfulness and could be that source of intimate relation and fellowship one for another. And it's been a remarkable story, again, that grace triumphs over human failure. Grace triumphs over the nature of human sin. I've never shared this story publicly, but I just feel led to share it this morning. I'm going to share this in conclusion. Three days before my mother died, and some of you who were with me several years ago as we went through that journey, uh, she was in her final weeks of life in a hospital in downtown Tulsa in a hospice center. Three weeks before my mother died, she handed Christy a note. She said, please be sure Alan gets this. We knew her death was, was coming in soon. Christy gave me the note, and at that time, you know, she was near death. She was still, we thought, alert, but at times we weren't sure if she was completely alert, kind of confused. And I read this note, and it made no sense to me, really. I read it and reread it and reread it, and it was something about before she and my father had met, and this goes way back, uh, you know, to the time of World War II, and, and uh I knew the story of, of she and my dad. They'd known each other from school, but he came back from World War II, and she was working 
uh, for Dr. Mansell Fish. He had just finished a two-year degree in business college, and the two of them met and started dating and married and had over 50 years of marriage, wonderful, wonderful years of marriage together. But, but in this note, she, she was trying to tell me something about four she, before she met my dad, and I couldn't quite make it out, and so the next day, while she was still sort of lucid, sort of not totally lucid, I started asking her questions, and she said, yes, before I was married to your dad, when I was very, very young, I had another marriage, and it only lasted months, and it finally ended in divorce, and I said, well, and she said, she said we've kept that from you, we've really not talked about it all these years. It's just uh, when, when your dad and I married, we decided we were putting that part behind us and we never mentioned it or brought it up. And I said, Mom, what, what went on in your life before you met my dad is really of no concern to me. All I know is you and dad have had a wonderful marriage and you've provided a wonderful, you've been wonderful parents and provided a wonderful family for us. And that's the only thing that's important. And, and she said, I've been worrying about that, you know, all of my life now. Uh, The next day she passes away. I'll be honest with you, at the time, Christy and I both thought she's hallucinating. Uh, There's no, she's imagining this, she's not speaking clearly. I knew her history, knew all of her friends, never in all of the years of our life any mention of any incident prior to her marrying my dad. And I thought, she's just confused. The nurses said she's she's not in a totally clear state. Until I get into the safety deposit box. And in the safety deposit box, I find from clear back during the time of World War II, a divorce decree. Found out she had been married for about eight months, and uh, she and her first husband must not have had uh, too great a possession because here was the settlement in the decree. This was all still in the decree. Uh, the husband got the bicycle, and my mom got the refrigerator. <laughs> that was the settlement. But what most caught my attention was the statement for the reason of divorce and why it was granted. It was granted on the cause of extreme cruelty. That was the statement the judge put on the divorce degree. Divorce granted on grounds of extreme cruelty. And then I thought back, I cannot begin to tell you uh, the impact that had on me in thinking about that and why, why did they keep that a secret all those years except for the fact that my mother and her family grew up in a very, very, very conservative church for which divorce was almost equal to the unpardonable sin in those days. And it was just something that they felt shamed into, I think, and that she hid and didn't want to talk about for the rest of her life. And at first that had a tremendously significant impact on me. It took me a while to get my mind around that. But then to begin contemplating the story that I knew, how my dad came home from World War II, And here was this young woman who had been through this tragedy of a marriage that ended with extreme cruelty and how they found each other and fell in love with each other and pledged their promise and their life to each other and spent 50 years together. Uh, They had one of the most wonderful marriages I've ever known. Bore a child who was one of the brightest, smartest guys I've ever... I mean, they were just... I mean, how how could there be a better... End of the story. (laughs) But when I look at this, I see wrapped up into this, wrapped up into this, the tragedy of human failure, but again, the great lesson that grace triumphs over human failure. Grace triumphs over human sin. God's power redeems. So the most horrific moments and stories of our life. And so Jesus, in speaking to the Pharisees, who wanted to turn this into kind of a little test case, wanted to make this kind of a, some kind of a gotcha kind of 
moment and and lift up, you know, well, what about, you know, in the laws of Moses, it says all you got to do is write a certificate of divorce and stuff. In the midst of that context, Jesus said, God designed marriage for our benefit. He brought us together for his purposes. He put us into a union that reflects the very nature of Christ and his relationship with his church. God has done a wonderful thing. And what is required of us is faithfulness and promise keeping and honesty and caring and to do all that we can by God's grace to cherish and value the marriages that God has blessed us with. Thanks be to God. Amen. sort of catching my breath here. I can't tell you the flood of emotions that went through my mind in preparing that message this week. Um, Altar flowers in memory of Belinda McCormick given by Robert McCormick. We remember and always will the gift that she was to this congregation. Other joys this morning. Anybody else with a joy? I see a hand right over here. Lori. Hey, good to see you. Wish you'd have brought some cooler weather up here from Texas. Uh, (laughs) Anybody else? I see a hand in the back. Yes. 50 years. Congratulations to you. That's wonderful. Anybody else? Joys? Joys? Concerns? Special concerns coming up? Janet, you've got a surgery coming up, but they've postponed that, haven't they? And they put that off. It's going to be a what? A, okay, okay. So we're going to pray you through that. The Wolf family back from. Oh, I forget now. Is it Wyoming? It's one of those northern states. We're so glad to have you with us today and see the whole family there. Thank you for being with us. Other concerns? Uh, yes. Okay, a heart cath, getting ready for eventually a a heart valve replacement. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, Linda Holman had a valve surgery done, and she did. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, her her uh, I think it was her brother came over and her sister in law and. They just kept her one night, and I went by to see her at the hospital. She was up walking around the halls and looking very good. So, uh, so thank you for that report. Let's uh, turn our hearts to prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your amazing grace in our lives. Thank you for the times when we failed in all kinds of ways. You were there to forgive and restore and renew and to move us forward. Thank you for the fellowship of this church where we can join together to listen to one another, care for one another, encourage and support one another, study together and grow together. Thank you for all of these opportunities. In the midst of heat and drought, 
Uh, we pray that you keep us safe in the midst of a <coughs> flare-up of COVID. Dear God, show your mercy and restore our health, we pray, in every way. And for those who have had surgery and are recovering or are anticipating surgery and preparing, we just pray that you would be with them, even as our praise team sang this morning that you'd go before us and never leave us or forsake us, but be with us in every circumstance of life. Help us continue to be people who love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and seek first your kingdom. Strive to be people living the love of Jesus, for we ask this all in the name of the one who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will our ushers come forward? And as they come, let us continue in prayer. Lord, bless our giving, and help us to be good stewards of all that we receive, to serve you and further your kingdom, through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Jim, congregation, I'm going to pull a switcheroo on you. Can we go to 365 for our closing hymn? Jim played as his offertory, Grace Greater Than Our Sin, and uh, I was listening to that. I think that's the song we need to sing in closing. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. It's 365 in your hymnal. It's not going to be up on the screen. So uh, Sarah, standing on the promises is out. You don't need to do that. 365. Anybody wants to come for a moment of prayer while we sing this, you're more than welcome. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. of our How'd you pull those words up on the screen so quickly like that? That's amazing. Thank you. That's great. Pray you have a blessed day. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.